Jane O'Neill holds a master's in art history from Boston University and a master's in education from the Harvard University Graduate School of Education. She is a native, she is a New Hampshire native and has worked at some of the state's most esteemed cultural institutions, including the League of New Hampshire Craftsmen, where she served as exec executive director and the Courier Museum of Art, where she held a, the role of senior educator. Jane founded the Courier Alzheimer's Cafe and led the tour program for the museum and the Frank Lloyd Wright designed Zimmerman House. She has taught art history at the college level for more than a decade, most recently at the New Hampshire Institute of Art. Culturally Curious's mission is to engage, educate, and unify groups through facilitated arts experiences that inspire joy and foster critical and creative thinking, as well as an appreciation for our shared humanity. Tonight's presentation is on Frida Kahlo, and the title is Love, Painting, and Pain. Frida Kahlo has become a household name in recent years with movies, books, and countless products dedicated to her art and likeness. This program will go beyond the artist's famous facial hair and penetrating stare and explore her life and her work, particularly as it relates to the trolley accident she survived as a teen and her passionate and often tumultuous marriage to fellow artist Diego Rivera. And I am absolutely fascinated um, by Frida Kahlo, and I'm, I'm really excited for this program tonight. So thank you all for joining us. And again, just one more time, please remain muted during the program and direct your questions to the chat to be asked after the program. So thank you, Jane, so much for bringing this to us. Thank you, Jess. I'm so excited to give this program because I really love Frida Kahlo as well. And um, I became really interested in her, passionate about her work when I was in high school and I read this book by Hayden Herrera. I highly recommend it. It's essentially her biography and um, <clears throat> tracing her biography with, uh, with her paintings, which we're going to do to a certain extent tonight. And when you do that, when you look at Frida Kahlo's work all together, it's, um, it's an intimate experience. You begin to feel you know, intimately acquainted with her. And so forgive me, I'm going to be calling her, I'm sure I will be referring to her as Frida throughout the program tonight, but it's because of this feeling of knowing her. Uh, generally speaking, I try to refer to artists by their last name, but I feel like I know her. And I think many of us feel like we know her because she painted so many self-portraits like the one that we have on the screen here tonight. Um, and like I said in the program description, they tend to have this kind of stoic expression, uh, the signature facial hair. And then oftentimes there's a reference to pain, emotional pain or physical pain. In this case, we have these, this kind of thorny necklace that's poking into the, the flesh of her neck and drawing blood there. So there's always um, some kind of pain point to connect to. She describes her pain and illustrates her pain in a way that really no other artist has, um, particularly in the 20th century. So you feel connected. It's easy to feel connected to Frida Kahlo. So we're going to dive right into her work tonight and um, dive right in with the kind of organizing uh, concept for tonight's program. And that is probably her most frequently uh, quoted statement ever, which is, there have been two great accidents in my life. One was the trolley and the other was Diego. Diego was by far the worst. <laughs> so we are going to be examining her life within the context of those two accidents and how, um, and how she depicted uh, herself as a result of, of those two great accidents too. I love this photograph of the artist. It looks like she's just turned away from her easel and is about to sort of divulge something intimate and personal here. So already we're feeling like friends. Uh, if we look at our program overview tonight, we'll start off with a short introduction to the artist. Then we'll talk about um, essentially the trolley accident and uh, physical pain and her strength and resilience. And then we'll turn our attention to the other great accident, Diego Rivera, and talk about her love, her loss, her heartache throughout her life too, and how that um, gets represented in her artwork. And then we will wrap up with her death and legacy. This is another great photograph of the artist. I just, I love the composition here because you have this kind of crisscrossing scarf and then her arm going across her chest at this diagonal, reaching up towards those hand earrings, those really funky earrings. Um, and it's just this nice little connection. Apparently, 
uh, Pablo Picasso gave her those earrings. And I have to say, uh, no matter how ugly the jewelry, if Picasso gave it to me, I'd probably be wearing it too. <laughs> so let's get started with Frida Kahlo. We see her here looking very sophisticated in, in this photograph with her cigarette here, but we're going to start much earlier on. And Frida Kahlo was born just outside of Mexico City in 1907. We see her here with a few of her family members. She was the third of four daughters. And, um, and we see her here with her mother at the center. And she once described her mother as kind, active and intelligent, but also calculating, cruel and fanatically religious. So you sort of get the, the uh, a, a real good sense of what their relationship might've been like with a quotation like that. Um, I think you see a little bit of, of that um, religious fervor or at least religious symbolism kind of creeping into some of Frida Kahlo's artwork, even with that thorn necklace that we saw before, it could be sort of like a reference to the crown of thorns. But when Frida Kahlo was just a little girl, just around the age of six years old, she contracted polio. And so that kept her at home from school for quite some time. And it had forged a very strong relationship with her father, who we see here. Um, in a portrait that Frida Kahlo painted, and we see her painting it over here on the right. And it was inspired by this photograph that he took of himself. He was a professional photo photographer. So we can sort of think of this as a very early selfie over here on the left. And so they, they formed this strong bond when she was a young girl. He also had sort of ongoing medical issues. He uh, had epilepsy throughout his life. And so it was a point of connection and he helped to ensure that she was engaged in activities that helped to strengthen her. Maybe there were the kinds of um, activities that uh, most parents didn't uh, encourage a young girl to be a part of, but, um, but it really, I think, sort of strengthened her character. Frida Kahlo's ancestry was really important to her, and we'll see how it creeps into so many of her paintings, but it also uh, helps to define helps her to define herself in terms of her dress and how she presents herself to the world. So what we're looking at here is a painting by Kahlo that she painted in 1936. This is in the collection of uh, MoMA. And it is essentially a family tree. We see uh, Frida Kahlo, she's painted herself as a very young child standing in this garden surrounded by what looks like almost like a dollhouse. But this is in fact her childhood home. Uh, her childhood home was painted blue. It was called the Casa Azul. And, um, and so she's kind of firmly rooted in that space. And we can see that she's holding a uh, red ribbon and that sort of cradles the image of her parents just above her and then a second self-portrait of Frida as a baby in her mother's womb and then the ribbons extend up to her grandparents over here. Uh, we think many of us who are familiar with it with Frida Kahlo oftentimes think of her as um, you know the epitome of, of a traditional Mexican woman but her background was not uh, just purely Mexican. Her father was actually German. And, um, and sometimes she would even sort of uh, fabricate uh, aspects of his biography too. Her mother was um, Spanish Indian. So we see these references to fertility here with the baby in the womb, even um, the sperm and the egg down here, maybe even extending to some of the, the plants and the flowers here. But what I wanted to draw your attention to with this work in particular, is how Frida Kahlo can weave a story with a line. Sometimes it's a ribbon, sometimes it's a vine or a row of thorns uh, or it's an artery, but she, uh, she tells, a, she creates a great narrative with these lines and she, she draws your attention to exactly what she wants you to be looking at. Uh, so much so that uh, the surrealist artist Andre Breton once, once described her work as a ribbon wrapped around a bomb. <laughs> because once you follow these lines, there's oftentimes something pretty explosive at the end of it. So it's a good indication of her storytelling abilities and her ability to make us feel really powerful emotions. So we see her here as a young girl. Here are a few more photo, well, in this case, photographs of, uh, of Frida Kahlo as a young woman. And I think that they give sort of a good introduction to how she was 
kind of experimenting with what her identity might be like. And there was a fluidity to that identity, we can see. Um, on the left, she's dressed in men's or, or young boys' clothing. Um, and she would do this in intermittently throughout her life. And on the right, she's dressed in more um, sort of traditional Mexican clothing. And that becomes a big part of her identity at a young age. So after um, sort of overcoming the struggles with polio, she begins to really thrive as a teenager. And she goes to uh, a very competitive high school where she is one of 35 women at the school that has over a thousand students. And she makes a name for herself right off the bat because she's kind of bold. Um, she is a prankster. She's really confident. She's interested in Mexican heritage. She's in interested in social justice. So she's out there. She's a real leader. And, um, and so she, she uh, creates or draws a lot of attention to herself. And, you can, and I think you can see with these images too, that adopting either one of these styles is kind of another way to draw attention to yourself. But I think the ultimate way that she does that is by um, emphasizing and cultivating the facial hair that she's so famous for. And it's funny because at this point, I'm so familiar with it and, I, and I'm sure many of her fans are so familiar with it that it's not shocking at all. But I, I recently shared some of the images of Frida Kahlo with um, some people who were unfamiliar with her and they couldn't, they couldn't leave it alone. They were really shocked by the facial hair. So we had a good conversation about it and how you know, cultivating a unibrow, especially as, you know, an attractive young woman is really a way to push, you know, the, beyond the expectations of, you know, what is appropriate for your gender um, at your age. So she's uh, uh, kind of breaking down boundaries in some ways. She's defining what's beautiful and, um, and she's, you know, defining so much about herself here. There are still people doing this today. There's um, an Instagram model, that's a thing, <laughs> who has uh, about a half a million followers because she's very consciously cultivating a unibrow. And in this case, with the photograph on the right, I mean, she's, uh, she's quoting essentially Frida Kahlo visually. But I mean, this is a beautiful woman. And without those unibrows, she would just be like another beautiful woman. And this is certainly a, a way to draw attention to her. All right, but even with the unibrow, um, during Frida Kahlo's short lifetime, she was considered uh, sort of a fashion icon and a really beautiful woman. So the image on the left here is from 1937. She appeared in a spread in vogue, and we can see that she's wearing sort of traditional clothing here. And then the image on the right is she graced the cover of Vogue. I believe it was decades after her death. But um, but at this point, we see that she's kind of a style icon and, and beautiful in her own right, um, maybe because not in spite of the, the facial hair. So we're going to backtrack just a little bit and go to one of her earliest portraits. And of course, we see the unibrow again. <laughs> this was painted in 1926. So she is not yet 20 years old when she has painted this self-portrait. And uh, when I look at it, I'm reminded of two really important things. Um, a, that she was self-taught. She didn't take formal art, art lessons. But B, she was very familiar with the history of art. She created this painting for her boyfriend at the time as a sort of way to keep him around. I think she was sort of afraid that he was about to end things. So she made this painting, she gave it to him, and then she wrote him a letter and she referred to this painting as being um, the Botticelli, his Botticelli, her Botticelli. So of course, in this case, she's thinking of the early Renaissance master um, Botticelli, who's probably most famous for the birth of Venus. So we see that Frida Kahlo is very consciously quoting that very uh, long, elegant neck and you know the elegant long fingers here. When I look at her early self-portrait, I think that she's also very consciously quoting the Mona Lisa, you know, the most famous portrait of all time. But we have a half-length format um, portrait. We have the arms crossed um, at the bottom of the painting, and we have the face in that three-quarter profile view with the eyes focused out at us, the viewer. You'll notice that in the Mona Lisa, there is this kind of wild background, and uh, Frida Kahlo has done that for her background, too. We see these kind of swirling waves, and those waves definitely remind me of the swirling clouds in Vincent van Gogh's Starry, Starry Night. 
So I think she's taking all sorts of different sources here, putting them together, synthesizing them and making them her own in a really smart and creative way. And we'll see that, um, that her style sort of blossoms and, and solidifies and becomes her own in a short amount of time. But when we're thinking about Frida Kahlo, especially for our purposes tonight, um, it makes sense to kind of focus on her self-portraits. She painted about 200 paintings in her lifetime and roughly a third of them are self-portraits. And she said, you know, I focused on, on self-portraits because I'm so often alone and my face is the one that I know the best. So it's a great way to sort of access her, um, her internal life through these self-portraits. I also brought this last image in for this section just to remind us that, um, that Frida Kahlo sort of carefully cultivated this identity as a traditional Mexican woman. And we'll see that play out in her clothing and then oftentimes in her hair as well. She uh, typically depicts herself with this tight updo, oftentimes with ribbons or with flowers in her hair. So this is all part of a very conscious um, style that she, that she adopted. And it certainly got her attention throughout her life. And, I mean, particularly as she traveled outside of Mexico too. The painting that we're looking at here, the self-portrait here was um, dedicated to her physician at the time and essentially thanking him because um, in this picture, we can see again, uh, this is a picture about physical pain. There's another thorn necklace here and it's drawing blood um, right there on her neck. And so, um, so this is perhaps a really good segue to thinking about her body and that, and that trolley accident. And of course, I can't leave this slide without saying there are those hand earrings again from Picasso. It makes sense to immortalize them. All right, so let's turn our attention to Frida Kahlo's body and, um, and the trolley accident that had uh, such a huge impact on her life. This is such a haunting photograph, isn't it? This is from the last few years of her life. She's lying in bed here. As we'll see, she spends a lot of time in, in her bed, but we've got this kind of dramatic light and shadow and she seems to be staring right out at us. So we're going to be talking about her pain and her resilience here, beginning with that trolley accident. So this is the artist's depiction of what happened. Uh, when she was 18 years old, Frida Kahlo was riding a bus with her boyfriend at the time, and the bus collided with a streetcar or a trolley. And um, her boyfriend uh, uh, managed to sort of escape this accident relatively unscathed. But just to make sure I capture everything that happened to her, I'm just going to read to you her injuries, the list of her injuries from this accident. She suffered a broken spinal column. Um, it was broken in at least three places. A broken collarbone, a dislocated shoulder, several broken ribs, 11 fractures to her right leg, broken and dislocated right foot. And then her pelvis was broken in at least three places. And she was impaled by an iron handrail from the trolley that went through her pelvis and through her, her abdomen and uterus. It's hard to imagine a person surviving something like this, let alone thriving. So you can see from the image that she drew shortly after this accident, um, she was in a full body cast for quite some time as part of her recovery. And very quickly, uh, this was a, an accident that impacted her entire life. She had anywhere from 20 to 33 surgeries over the next few decades of her life. And she was um, almost constantly wearing either a hard plaster corset, like the ones that you see in these images, or other kinds of braces to support that broken back of hers. And this is the reason why you so often see these images of her lying down in bed. It's either to um, recover or literally to try and ease the pain that she was in. So before I move on from, from that, uh, from these images, I just want to emphasize the fact that she used those hard plaster corsets as a blank canvas and she would actually paint them while she was lying in bed. So the one over here, we can see that she has painted a column where her spine would be and, and has shown that it's broken. And then the rest of it is covered with these, um, these elements that sort of look uh, like, you know, aspects of, you know, uh, of the human body, perhaps under a microscope. And then over here, we see her painting with a hand mirror for help and, um, and, and using 
that court as, um, as the, the format for her artwork. So within a few months after her accident, she is able to walk again. How amazing is that right there? And she had been using art as sort of a, a way to keep herself occupied during her recovery. And while she had been in high school, she'd been really interested in the sciences and had you know, sort of I thought that she would become a physician. But after the accident, she decided it was art for her all the way. She said, I have not died. And moreover, I have something to live for. And that something is painting. I love the intensity of the expression here as she's uh, a young woman working on this portrait. Now, throughout her life, we're going to see uh, images that she created that reference her physical pain. This is a drawing that was uh, really only recently discovered that shows uh, what Frida Kahlo's body and sort of where her mind was uh, in 1934. We can see that she has drawn herself wearing traditional Mexican clothing, but she's rendered the clothing transparent so that we can see her nude body underneath. And we see that she's wearing a corset to support her spine, which is again, this broken column. And then we can see that she's also uh, depicted butterflies on her leg there. And I'm sure that's the leg that was broken 11 times. She once said, um, what do I need feet for if I have wings to fly? And there are those wings right there on her leg in this case. Frida Kahlo also said, um, appearances can be deceiving. And I think that's a good thing to keep in mind when we see all of these images of her wearing you know, long skirts or dresses that cover up almost her whole body. It was an opportunity to cover up um, some of this pain and to cover up uh, you know, uh, corsets and, um, and, and in some cases even deformities. So let's continue on thinking about how she has depicted her body and, um, and what she was experiencing in her artwork. Always love this painting. This is called The Dream of the Bed. And this is from 1940. And I think sometimes remarkably, despite what she's been through and what she's continued to suffer with, I think that there are some paintings that she creates that are about her body and they are hopeful in nature. So I would say that's what's going on here. We see Frida Kahlo in her very own canopy bed um, and the bed seems to be kind of floating in the sky and she is resting peacefully. There, uh, um, her head is turned towards us and it's resting on two pillows. And it seems like there are these vines that are growing down here at her feet and kind of spreading leaves around her, her abdomen, where, where her spine is really, and uh, you know, up around her shoulders and her head. And to me, that signifies growth and renewal and a sort of peace there. But just above her, of course, you can't help but notice, there's this giant grinning skeleton. And he's in the same position that she's in. He's facing out towards us. He's got his head on two pillows. He's holding a bouquet of flowers and his body is wired with dynamite. Sort of signifying in this case, you know, death can happen at any moment. Like this could go off at any moment. And she sort of thought this, this was kind of like a humorous reminder of, of one's own mortality. Um, and believe it or not, she actually slept with this uh, skeleton over her canopy bed in real life. Um, her husband, I think, did not find it quite as humorous and he would sometimes refer to it as her lover. Um, so another image that she created that I think sort of has a hopeful note, despite what she was feeling and suffering with physically, is this picture called Rooted from 1943. And we can see the artist here is, is lying on this kind of cracked and barren ground here, but she's reclining almost like a Renaissance um, Venus, you know, almost like a Renaissance courtesan almost, you know, she's looking out at us almost coyly and um, with her elbow resting on a pillow. And she's wearing this long traditional skirt, but she has rendered her torso missing. It just doesn't even exist. We can see right through her body and in where her spine would be, there's this tangle of green vines that grow out over her body and in front of her into these giant green leaves that are you know, the size of her head or bigger. And when you look at these green leaves, uh, the veins of the leaves have actual red blood in the veins. And those veins extend out beyond the leaves and sort of trickle down 
almost as though they are the aspects of this picture that are rooting, like they're, they're um, digging into this barren landscape. So again, she tells so much with just a simple line in a picture. And she's looking out at us as she does in so many of her self portraits, very matter of factly. Um, so again, I would say the green here, the growth, it signifies kind of strength and renewal. And I think that there's some hope here. But the next few images that we're going to see are not quite as hopeful in nature. Frida Kahlo was not afraid to show us her pain and, and exactly what she was experiencing in her life. This is a picture called Broken Column from 1944. And we can see, once again, she's rendering her spine as this broken column. But in order to show it to us, she's essentially like torn open her torso in this picture. And you can see that the landscape there is torn open in the same way. Uh, her body's being held together by these uh, fabric straps. But we actually know this corset in particular, and there's metal underneath those fabric straps. So this was a really um, uncomfortable corset to wear. And um, it was essentially keeping her body from collapsing in on itself. So she is showing us that on essentially every square inch of her skin, there is pain and discomfort. There's like these nails or tacks sticking out of her flesh all the way up to her face. And once again, she's in that three quarter profile view. Her face is actually stoic. It's not twisting in pain, but there are so many tears running down her cheek as she looks out at us directly. This is, um, this is such a strong picture in terms of the way it just, I mean, it just captivates the viewer and you can't help but feel empathy for the situation that she is in here. Uh, the next image I'm going to show you, I would say is the toughest image from this section, sort of prepare yourself here. Um, this is an image that she created that's called Without Hope. And we can see here that she is lying in bed and there's this wooden contraption sort of mounting, mounted over her bed. There's a funnel with this kind of grotesque uh, meat still life, this cornucopia that's um, coming down the funnel towards her. And she painted this at a time when she was uh, sort of dramatically underweight and a doctor actually prescribed force feeding. So every two hours she was force fed uh, like a food puree. And, and this is a picture that expresses that discomfort there. The photograph on the left sort of explains what that wooden contraption is. We can see uh, Frida in this kind of rudimentary um, traction here. There's like a slip of fabric underneath her chin and it's tied to her headboard, sort of stabilizing her in her back. But as she lays there, this wooden um, contraption functions as an easel where she can uh, draw and paint just over her head. So I kind of love this because, you know, the mythology around somebody like Michelangelo is that he, you know, was lying on his back as he painted the Sistine Chapel. And of course, that's not true. But when it comes to Frida Kahlo, uh, she was lying on her back when she was creating at least some of her masterworks here. If we look at Without Hope and we sort of zoom in a little bit closer, we can see once again, it's that stoic expression, but her face and cheeks covered in tears. Uh, we, we also see that kind of barren cracked background and she likes to sort of add in the duality of, of night and day in a lot of her paintings. And I think in this case, it's sort of referencing kind of a, an around the clock um, pain and discomfort that goes along with something like this. Um, she once said, I am not sick, I am broken, but I'm happy to be alive as long as I can paint. So over the next few years, particularly during the 1940s, she creates a lot of images that, that reference what's happening um, to her body and, and um, her, her physical being. And I've noted uh, several times now that she tends to have a, a rather stoic expression uh, with these pictures, and then she'll add tears sort of after the fact, but there is almost um, like a disconnect between the facial expression and the tears. And what we're looking at here is a 1945 painting called The Mask. And this is a self-portrait. This is Frida's sort of signature updo, that black hair in, uh, in the background. And then she's holding this kind of peachy orange mask to her face that has this purple fringe on it. And notice for the first time, we have this face that's 
kind of a grimace. I mean, it's, it's, um, it's definitely more twisted than her typical expression. And there are um, little holes here that are cut out for her eyes, but the mask itself has painted teardrops on it. So this is a really interesting way to show what you're feeling, to have to wear a mask to, to convey um, sort of what's behind the mask is an, is an interesting idea. So in um, 1946, Frida Kahlo underwent a major surgery on her back that she'd been very hopeful about. And unfortunately, it just didn't go as she had hoped. And she created a couple of paintings um, that sort of helped to reflect on, on the experience. And this one, Wounded Deer, is one of those pictures. So I bring in the photograph on the left just to um, just to show us that she's familiar with deer, she's um, intimate with deer. So she has a good sense in terms of what she's kind of channeling when she created this image on the right. So she is showing us herself again. This is another self-portrait, but she has put her own face and head on the body of a deer, a deer that has been hunted, a deer that has been shot with so many arrows, almost 10 arrows there, I think. And it's bloody and it looks like, you know, it's, it's almost certainly going to die. Interestingly, she has given herself antlers, which um, would signify that she was a male deer. And that just reminds me of the fact that she wasn't afraid to wear men's clothing sometimes. She was known to have, um, uh, affairs with women. So this is her kind of, you know, once again, kind of playing with her identity here or, um, or how she portrays herself to the world. So she's not in that same barren cracked landscape that we've seen before, but she's in a pretty dry and, and barren forest that with um, these trees that don't really have leaves and like uh, broken branches here. And um, just in front of her, I think significantly, we see a, a bit, a, one branch that has leaves and, and it's a broken branch right lying in front of her. And my reading has indicated that that was part of um, uh, a Mexican funerary tradition that you would put a broken tree branch on a grave. So this is her really kind of reflecting on her pain and her mortality in this picture. Um, and then you even have like the lightning and the thunder in the background over the seascape there. So you can imagine that she's kind of referencing, you know, um, you know, shooting pain in, inside of her. Interestingly enough, she gave this uh, painting to some friends as a wedding present. I can't imagine a, a friend in so much pain and who represents it this way and then sort of living with this picture every day. Um, one other painting that she created in response to that same surgery is this one here, which is called The Tree of Life Stay, Remain Strong or Stay Strong. And that's the, the translation of this little flag here. So again, we have the duality of night and day, and we have two Fridas in this picture. We have one that is anonymous, a patient in a hospital bed, um, a sort of modern day version, or, or, or a modern hospital bed, I should say. And you know, what a wise thing. Don't we all sort of feel anonymous when we're in a hospital bed? We can see that, um, she has these incisions in her back and these are like open bleeding wounds, once again, connecting her to this landscape here. And then we see her over here on the right under the moon where she's wearing this traditional Mexican dress with the, with the traditional updo and the ribbons in her hair. And we see her holding on to one of these back braces and also wearing one of them. And that probably um, really connects to, to the title of the painting and the trans and the, the text in that flag about um, the tree of life, you know, something that's, that's um, strong and rooted and, and keeping you strong. And, and once again, she's looking out at us sort of uh, rather matter of fact in this case. So we know off and on um, through the rest of her life, she is spending um, extended time in bed and that that is a, a uh, by necessity, a space where she is creative. So we have another photograph of here, photograph of her here lying in bed painting. The last image I wanted to show you that um, that sort of reflects on her body and her physical pain is this one here from 1951. And this was only a few years before she died. 
she, this is a, a painting that she created, a self-portrait that she created for this doctor who we see in the self-portrait, but then also in the photograph. And didn't she just nail that portrait there? I mean, this looks exactly like him. Um, so this is sort of a, a, a thank you note in the, in the form of a painting in this case, because this particular doctor performed seven surgeries on her spine in the space of one year. And Frida Kahlo really felt like he had saved her life. So this was um, really kind of a, a heartfelt thank you and um, forgive the pun because of course, what we see here in her self-portrait is that she's turned her palate into this big sort of uh, bloody heart. And, and it looks almost like an anatomical drawing with, with the, the veins and, um, and the arteries here, but it's as though she's offering, she's making this offer to the painted portrait of her doctor. And she's holding almost like a quiver of paintbrushes here that are dripping red paint, or you know, I think we would associate that with red blood. We'll also notice here too, that she is now using a wheelchair in, in the painting and in real life. So that again, sort of speaks to sort of how far along um, her pain has come and, um, and, and how she's sort of struggling with recovery over time as well. All right, so we are going to turn our attention to the second great accident in her life, the one that was by far the worst, and that is um, Diego Rivera. And, um, and that was her husband, and, um, and he was a world famous painter when they met and married. So we're going to be talking about her love, her loss, and her heartache, because this was most certainly a very tumultuous relationship. Now, before I go any further, I will note that both Frida Kahlo and Diego Rivera had extramarital affairs. They essentially had an open marriage for at least a period of, of, their, um, of their union. And, um, and that did kind of work for them for some time. For Frida too, it, she had affairs with men and with women, but without a doubt, it is Diego that held her heart. And I'll share even um, a passage or two from her diary just to give you a sense in terms of how strongly she felt about this man. So here are a couple of images of the couple from right around the time they got married. In fact, the image on the left is one of their official wedding portraits. So Frida Kahlo had first met Diego Rivera when he was painting a mural at her high school. She kind of went into the room and sat there and watched him paint and, um, and talked with him a little bit, but you know, maybe spent four hours with him. Supposedly told a friend later on, you know, that's the man I'm going to marry. But it was years later that they got reacquainted at a party and the following year that they were married. And that was 1929 that they got married. Uh, at the time, Diego Rivera, well, Diego Rivera was 20 years older than her. And he also had had two common law wives before Frida Kahlo. Um, as you can see from these images, he was a great big man and she was this tiny, tiny woman. So in some ways, they were the study of opposites. Her, her parents famously said, it's like a union between an elephant and a dove. <laughs> it didn't make sense to them, but, um, and they weren't necessarily uh, in favor of the, of the wedding, but her father recognized that this world famous um, painter that her, her daughter was marrying would, um, was wealthy enough to be able to uh, support her and pay for her medical bills. So despite the fact that they are a study of opposites, they had a lot in common. And um, excuse me, just one moment. <clears throat> and so one of the first things they had in common, obviously, was art and a passion for art, but they were also very passionate about politics. They were both communists. They were both pranksters. They both, ha they both had this kind of deep well of knowledge and a respect for each other's deep well of knowledge. So I can't overstate the intensity of their connection. It was very intense, and this was throughout their, the entire time that they were married. <clears throat> Now, just to go back to the sense of the study of opposites, because it's kind of too poetic for words. We have um, Diego Rivera as a muralist who worked on a grand scale, and he was creating murals um, throughout uh, Mexico and, and the United States. 
as, as um, the couple was married or just after the couple was married. This mural in particular is at the National Palace in Mexico City. And we can see from the figures in the foreground just how massive this mural is. Um, we'll see in just a moment that it's even bigger than what it looks like. But uh, we have a photograph of Diego, Diego Rivera over here standing up on scaffolding, painting one of his murals. And this is a reminder of just how physical it is to paint a mural. I mean, you're up and down scaffolding, you, um, oftentimes working on your feet. I know he had a chair a lot of the time, but if we take, well, it, with this image over here on the right, train your eye on some of these uh, soldiers in armor here in the foreground. And then in this next image, you see them here again. And the painting, this mural just goes on and on and on. He's just painting on such a monumental scale. And then we have his wife who is, you know, literally confined to images that are, you know, that are the size of canvases that can fit over her bed. Her images were small, they were intimate. They were uh, most often portraits of her. And, and he's creating, you know, these, these giant narratives about, you know, the history of, of countries. So, um, so there's, a, there's a certainly a, a kind of amazing poetry to that. And just after they got married, Frida Kahlo created this portrait of the couple. And it's interesting to see that she portrays her husband as the artist here and not herself. She just portrays herself as a traditional Mexican woman, as and and this was this um, this version of her is um, is one that that Diego Rivera particularly admired. A traditional Mexican woman, he also felt like this was kind of the most feminine version of her as well, and so this was kind of who she tried to be throughout the time that they were together because it it um, it very much pleased him. So shortly after they, um, they were wed, they, um, they headed up to Detroit, Michigan because Diego Rivera got this incredible commission to create a cycle of murals at the Detroit Institute of Art. And if you haven't been there, book your tickets now. This should be like your first post-COVID trip. The, the museum itself is amazing, but this cycle of murals is absolutely stunning. It's about 27 individual panels um, on the four walls of this really massive room. And it took him about nine months to complete. So here's just one wall here. And here's just a bench to give you um, human scale here. But he sort of starts off with these kind of um, ancient Aztec gods and kind of boils things down to um, modern day car manufacturing with these like really complicated factory scenes that are just, I mean, they're so intricate and they're so incredible. So while they are in Detroit, and I should mention that Frida Kahlo didn't necessarily love being in Detroit, but while they're there, she is pregnant. And sadly, she begins to miscarry. And so the process of losing this child, unfortunately, was taking a very long time. And I think it was becoming painful. So she went to the Henry Ford Hospital. And um, just sort of a trigger warning here, the next image is the, I would say the most difficult image to look at um, in tonight's show, but it, it's about the loss of a child. And so Frida Kahlo shows herself at, um, as a patient at the Henry Ford Hospital um, in Detroit. We've got the references to the city in the background, but the hospital bed itself seems to hover above this kind of barren, but not dried or cracked, just a, just a flat kind of um, um, sparse landscape. And she shows us herself in this bed at Henry Ford Hospital. She's nude, um, the, her sheets are bloodied from the loss of this child, but her belly is still full and her hand is over her belly. And then uh, sort of emanating from her hand are all of these uh, red ribbons. They sort of look like arteries at first, but they all extend to um, visual symbols of what she had just been through. Um, notably, you know, things that refer to her own body and her pelvis, um, the child itself. And then in this case, the snail um, is a reference to how slowly everything went um, as she was losing this child. And of course, um, there's just one giant tear here to, to uh, represent her heartache at, at this incredible loss. And I think that this was also really devastating to, um, to Diego Rivera too, because 
back at the Detroit Institute of Art, he alters one of his paintings to, um, to include this kind of seed in the ground that is part of a root system that is, you know, essentially like the foundation of, of, of the world and the universe. And as we zoom in, that seed is this perfect little baby. And so uh, they're both sort of clearly thinking about this child and the loss of this child. And, um, and it is incredible even that Frida Kahlo could become pregnant considering what had happened to her body in that trolley accident. And over the years, she would lose um, at least two more children um, at, um, it, through miscarriage and, um, and forced abortion. So, um, so this was something that really profoundly affected her and clearly him as well. So a few years later, they are back in Mexico and they decide to commission a world famous architect, Juan O'Gorman, to design um, homes and studios for both of them. And this is a really interesting design because you can see it's essentially two separate houses that are connected by this little walkway up here. So this is uh, Diego's side and this is Frida's side, appropriately blue, just like her childhood home. And, um, and each of these structures was essentially a whole house for living and a studio for creating. And then the artists could sort of go and visit each other as needed. So this is really kind of the perfect setup for uh, a couple that has an open marriage. They can kind of bring in other people as they desire. And like I said, that worked for them for some time, but um, ultimately, Diego Rivera had an affair with Frida Kahlo's sister. And I think that was particularly hard for her to grapple with. She actually created this self-portrait in response. And, um, and so we see her here um, absolutely heartbroken, so much so that she doesn't have a heart. There's literally a hole where her heart was. We saw that before with um, kind of the missing spine in the rooted picture. In this case, there's a pole going through that hole with little tiny Cupid playing seesaw because um, this seesaw, this back and forth is also signified in these two um, uh, essentially outfits that are hanging down by these red ribbons that also kind of seem like arteries. One of these uh, outfits is a sort of traditional Mexican uh, woman's dress and you can see that that outfit is kind of linking arms with Frida Kahlo. The other outfit, I my guess here is more of like a schoolgirl's outfit, maybe something that Frida Kahlo actually wore when she was um, that teenager that first met Diego Rivera and we can see that she's that this one is sort of in the background reaching out to Frida not connected with her the same way. Frida Kahlo herself is in sort of a, a modern dress and we don't really see her um, wearing things like this throughout most of her life. You'll notice that she doesn't have hands here. It's really these, these separate identities that, that um, are, are enabled in this picture. We can see uh, her, there's a wound on her foot, which is again, probably from that trolley accident, but she stands with one foot on the ground, one foot um, in the waves here. And there is this big giant bloody heart sort of spilling out blood on the shoreline here, some of it running into the water and then some of it running back to these mountains. So she's once again, really sort of spelling out in, um, in straightforward, but also really poetic terms, just how devastating um, this affair was for her. So this was 1937 and just two years later, Diego Rivera actually asks Frida Kahlo for a divorce. And you can imagine for somebody who felt so passionately about her husband, that this would have been uh, particularly uh, difficult to survive. So as a result, she creates this monumental work, monumental in scale for her because most of her images are, are short kind of bus length uh, self-portraits. Here, these are almost life-size self-portraits. And again, we see two Fridas, that's the name of this picture. This is from 1939, the year that she and Diego got, uh, got a divorce. And so she's showing us these two sides to her personality. And one of them is very much literally wedded to Diego Rivera. And we can see that the heart is broken in this woman. Um, one of the arteries snakes down behind her elbow. 
and sort of terminates in her lap. She's actually holding a pair of scissors that cuts it off and it's spilling blood into her lap. So a uh, very straightforward reference to the children that she's lost or the babies that she's lost. This broken heart also has an artery that extends to this other Frida whose clothes, though traditional, seem a little bit more updated. This Frida has a healthy heart. And, um, and one of her arteries snakes around her arm and terminates with this tiny little painting of Diego Rivera as a child. If you have really good eyes, you can see that it's labeled Diego. So it's kind of a reference to when he was more innocent <laughs> as well. And we look back to this and we see that these two Fridas are connected by, by blood and by very consciously holding on to each other. So we see that she's really grappling with who she is after she loses her husband. Here she is um, in a photograph in front of this painting. So we get this, a sense of the scale of the painting. Um, she seems so confident here. And believe it or not, the man that took this photograph, Frida Kahlo ended up having an affair with him. So, um, so even though she was devastated by the loss of her husband, her life still sort of goes on. But her artwork seems very much um, sort of stuck in, in reflecting upon this, this heartache. So this is a painting that she's also started in 1939. She finishes it um, a few years later, but we can see her here wearing this kind of traditional Mexican veil. The photograph on the right shows Frida Kahlo's mother. That's the head that is circled here. And we see several of her older relatives wearing a similar veil here. Frida Kahlo paints herself with Diego Rivera literally on her mind, on her forehead here. But this veil has these, um, these white threads that extend from it and extend all the way out to the edge of the picture frame. And they kind of hold her in place almost, I, I look at this and every time I think of a spider's web and she's like the insect that's been caught by the spider and all wrapped up in the web. And it's almost as though um, Diego is like ready to consume her, but she is stuck in some ways with him on her mind. And then um, it almost seems as though there are like these black hairs that are also kind of coming undone and getting stuck in that, um, in that web or in, in those threads as well. So one last image that is about this divorce from Diego. This is like the ultimate breakup image because so many of us do this, right? During any sort of um, big uh, emotional split in our lives, it's like you transform yourself. And for a lot of women, that means a great haircut. And for, <laughs> for Frida Kahlo, we can see that she has cut her own hair. So um, all, of, all of that hair that was in, you know, this ultra feminine up to while she was with Diego, it spread all over the floor in these tendrils that almost look kind of snake-like they almost look like they could crawl away. She's wearing men's clothes again, clothing again. So she has uh, come a long way away from that traditional um, feminine Mexican woman that, that Diego Rivera likes so much. And she is looking out at us very matter of factly here. But the, um, the lyrics up above sort of uh, betray her thoughts because uh, translated, um, it comes out to roughly, look, if I loved you, it was because of your hair. Now that you are without hair, I don't love you anymore. So it's almost as though she's framing this whole picture as through Diego Rivera's eyes. And there's something a little bit sad about that. Um, but everything ends up okay for her because in 1940, just a year after they got divorced, Diego and Frida get remarried. This is them at their civil ceremony um, in 1940, and then obviously kissing over here on the right. Um, in the 1930s, Diego had actually purchased um, Frida Kahlo's childhood home, the Casa Azul, uh, so that her father could continue to live there without a mortgage. After her father passed away, um, they moved there and, um, and Diego Rivera expands the house. So, um, so they're living very comfortably in her childhood home. And after their remarriage, uh, Frida Kahlo is trying to kind of put herself back together. There's this image called The Braid from 1941. And it's almost as though she picked up all that hair from off the floor and piled it onto her head and was kind of tying it up and, and hoping that it sort of stays together for dear life. Um, you almost get the sense that she's kind of grappling with like, how do I become 
that feminine version of myself again. It's uh, sort of unusual for her to portray herself with these um, bare shoulders. Now, this isn't the only case, but it, it's unusual. So over the 19, over the course of the 1940s, she creates a number of images that reference her relationship with Diego Rivera. This is a painting uh, that she created for their wedding anniversary. This is from 1944. And there's something about this one that I always find really intense and almost a little bit disturbing because clearly she sees their kind of their souls align here. But I think it's really interesting that, um, that she would portray the two of them as simply being one being. Um, that they don't have their kind of own separate identities that can come together. They are um, um, different sides of the same coin. So their faces just split down the middle and they are the one and the same. And that is extended and suggested beyond their faces through you know, these interlocking branches and, um, and other kind of um, organic material here. So there's an intensity there, certainly. <laughs> and she, in 1949, she created this image that's called the love embrace of the universe, the earth, um, Diego and me. And so we see the universe here as this kind of white face with these black eyes. The earth is Mexico for, for Frida Kahlo. And it's rendered with this kind of stylized mask like face. Um, but the earth you can see is sort of sprouting all of these plants and the cacti around her. Um, the chest is kind of split open like so many of those landscapes that we saw for, um, that Frida Kahlo painted about her body. And, and that crack sort of terminates at um, the earth's breast, which just has one drop of milk coming from the nipple. And, um, and if you look closely, you can see that the same thing is sort of happening with Frida Kahlo. She's got her chest is sort of cracked open too. And there are these references to, to sort of uh, um, uh, producing milk in her chest. And then interestingly enough, she has portrayed her husband as a giant man baby. <laughs> he's a full grown man that she is embracing as though he's a child. He's nude, <laughs> he's in her arms. He's also in Mexico's arms, but she's portraying him as being very wise. He has this giant third eye here. And as we zoom in, we can see that again, there's a tear on, on Frida Kahlo's face. And the way that she wrote about her husband at this time sort of indicated that, um, that she was kind of thinking of him as being sort of childlike. Um, she actually wrote, at every moment, he is my child, my child born every moment, um, diary from myself. Uh, she even talks about, uh, well, her diary sort of infantilizes him too. You know, she'll talk about him, you know, having too much ice cream and it's like, oh, it's Diego and being able to excuse behavior because of childlike tendencies allowed her to excuse other bad behavior um, like extramarital affairs. But I think I have this, um, this incredible quote from um, part of her diary where she talks about the intensity of, um, of her feelings for him. And let me just see if I can find that really quickly. Um, let's see here. She says, nothing compares to your hands, nothing like the green gold of your eyes. My body is filled with you for days and days. You are the mirror of the night the violent flash of lightning, the dampness of the earth, the hollow of your armpits is my shelter, my fingers touch your blood. So, um, so there is, like I said, a real intensity to this relationship. It always sort of reminds me of, um, you know, like the teenagers, Romeo and Juliet with this, just this really intense passion. So, um, so we move on thinking about um, her, her, the this uh, really passionate love that she had for Diego. But the other part of this too was the loss of, of her of her child and the loss of several children. And what we're looking at here is a photograph from the early 1950s, where she's again wearing a hard plastic corset that she's painted um, with the hammer and the sickle because she was really. Um, uh, interested and passionate about communism, but you can see that she's also painted a fetus 
over her torso and to, to lift up her shirt and to show that to other people. I mean, that is, um, that's like bearing your soul. That's, you know, that's really showing a profound loss. Um, and Frida Kahlo actually said, painting completed my life. I lost three children and a series of other things that would have fulfilled my horrible life. Painting took the place of all of this. I think the work is the best. But for art historians, that loss um, uh, manifested itself in her artwork in so many different ways. And in particular, with her paintings of her pets and especially her monkeys, uh, certainly her pets kept her from being lonely. She had a lot of pets. But when you see all of these pictures of her with her monkeys, you begin to sort of see them as surrogate children at a certain point. Um, <clears throat> she connects herself to them, uh, oftentimes using ribbons and that sort of thing. Um, there are several more. Uh, and, you know, I always look at them and I, and I think of that, that connection to the Mona Lisa as, um, you know, these half-length portraits with the three-quarter view. And traditionally, a Renaissance portrait would be, you know, sort of a, a Madonna and child. And in this case, it's Madonna and monkey. She also had dogs, so sometimes her dogs would come into her pictures, as we see in the in the middle image here. And she had parrots, <laughs> so she she spent a, a great deal of time representing all of these beloved creatures in her in her pictures. And I think um, we can't overanalyze um, the loss of those children, and then uh, sort of how these pets kind of functioned in her life, in in their place. But we'll finish up this section just going back to um, Diego and, and how large he loomed in her life. This is a painting from 1949. Uh, she did it at a time when she was very paranoid he was going to be leaving her for somebody else. That's sort of how we started off with her, her, her first uh, self-portrait too. But here um, she's come undone. You know, the, the tight updo is gone. Her hair is flowing down around her. It's almost choking her around her neck. And, um, and we see that stoic expression, but with the tears coming down her, her, um, her face. And then uh, very explicitly Diego on her mind and her respect for Diego conveyed through the third eye that she gives him there. So, um, so he, he had quite a hold on her and quite an impact on her life. And clearly um, there were aspects of this relationship that were uh, essentially a roller coaster for her. So as she's, kind of surviving um, physically what the trolley had done to her. She is navigating the ins and outs of this relationship with Diego Rivera throughout. So we will wrap up with her death and her legacy. And we see this uh, self-portrait from 1943, where she's showing us very specifically that death is on her mind. Um, and of course, in Mexican culture, that death is not an end, it's sort of a next step and the next chapter. So she sort of conveys that through um, the thorns, but then also these big leaves, these big green full leaves uh, behind her. So, um, so as, into the 1950s, and I should mention she died in 1954 at the age of 47. So at a very young age, but into the 1950s, her ability to paint uh, certainly declines and we don't see as many self-portraits during this time. We see a lot of fruit still lifes. Uh, art historians love to talk about um, uh, the sexual references to some of this fruit <laughs> or some of this fruit might suggest. Uh, there's also a, a, an element of self-portraiture here too because she includes her pets, she includes the Mexican flag um, with an image like this with the coconuts um, it seems to be a direct reference to her. I mean, it's called weeping coconuts. It reminds me almost of the mask. You know, it's like you see something else that seems like it could be in pain and, and you kind of project yourself onto it. Uh, the, the little flag here, though, translates to painted with all the love, Frida Kahlo. So we know that sort of in the final years of her life, even as her ability to paint is declining, even as... Um, there's this tumult between her and, and Diego Rivera, even as her health is, is declining. There's this sense that her heart is swelling and there's this sense of, of gratitude that kind of sneaks its way into her paintings, painted with all the love. So we see her here in the last few years of her life. She's lost a, a lot of weight. She's here painting another still life in her bed with Diego by her side, also her dog. 
And, um, and then uh, in 1953, just the year before she died, um, one of her legs was amputated because after a surgery, um, it, uh, she got gangrene. And so she was um, using a wheelchair primarily, but she also had prosthetic legs made. And because she was such a style icon, you know, they have, you know, Chinese silk embroidery on them. <laughs> so so she, she made it all look good. <laughs> now, one of the very last paintings, if not the last painting she ever made is this one here. And this is the one I think we should all take away with us from this whole program tonight. So, um, so what we're looking at is another fruit still life and we're looking at watermelons, watermelons that have been carved up you can almost sort of project her body as, as being the, the water mountains. Her body's been carved up over the years. And um, significantly in this watermelon down here in the foreground, she's added the text, Viva la Vida, which means long live life. Now think for a moment what this woman has been through. Think of all this pain, think of what she survived. And for her in her final days, in her final months, to have this kind of swelling heart that thinks, you know, life is beautiful, long live life, I think is just so incredible. And it's, um, and it's brave and it's really inspiring. Um, she wrote in her, in, in her diary, I hope the exit is joyful and I hope to never return, which I can completely understand considering what she'd been through. So she dies in 1954, as I said, at the age of 47, where she is on her deathbed. The official cause of death, death was a pulmonary embolism, but there was no autopsy. So there's plenty of speculation that she might have purposely overdosed. Here is a photograph from her funeral, which was really well attended. We can see that her coffin was draped with the communist flag. So by the time she died, um, she was very well respected uh, particularly in Mexico. Through much of her life, she was known as simply Frida because she was married to a very famous man who was simply known as Diego. But she wasn't really known as an artist in her own right. She was oftentimes call, uh, called Mrs. Rivera. And it took some time really before the public, uh, particularly the public in the US became familiar with her. So in 2001, she, uh, the US Postal Service issued a stamp with Frida Kahlo's face on it. Believe it or not, it was one of their most controversial stamps ever because at that time she was basically just known as a communist. <laughs> and so, so, you know, what was she doing on our, on our postage? But within a year or two, we have the Frida Kahlo movie starring Selma Hayek and, um, and the public becomes increasingly familiar with her. Frida Kahlo's niece uh, starts the Frida Kahlo Corporation, which licenses Frida's likeness to various products, not the, not the, um, the images that she painted, but just her face. So now Frida Kahlo's face is selling everything from shoes to nail polish to tequila. I don't know how she would feel about this. This is, it's, it's a strange thing, but I think it speaks to the fact that her that she functions as um, someone who's seen as as beautiful, as iconic, as strong, somebody who sort of went against the grain in their lifetime, um, who managed to thrive despite all all of the um, adversity in their life. Um, so I think that's what it really speaks to, and I think that's why people really sort of connect and and why her face resonates in so many ways. Uh, in 2017, she was made a character in a Disney movie called Coco, which I highly recommend if you haven't seen it. Almost all the characters are skeletons. And so here, of course, is a skeletal Frida Kahlo with her unibrow, um, painting a self-portrait with monkeys and fruit over here. And then the following year, uh, Mattel issued a series of inspiring women Barbies, which included Frida Kahlo. And this created a little bit of an uproar because the Barbie version didn't really have uh, a unibrow. <laughs> and that was, that's what Frida Kahlo is known for. Um, shortly after her death, there were rooms in her house that were shut up to the public uh, it, with the contents and all for about 50 years. So uh, just after the year 2000, they were reopened and or right around the year 2000, I should say. And, and so the public was 
uh, finally exposed to Frida Kahlo's clothes and her jewelry and her makeup and all of these items have been um, touring the country and probably beyond the country for years now and, and people can't really seem to get enough of being close to these objects and, um, and, and essentially gaining the sense of closeness to Frida Kahlo herself. Um, so there is something that's really uh, sort of intriguing and mesmerizing about her, her style, her wardrobe. Her childhood home has become the Frida Kahlo Museum. Diego Rivera donated the house for that purpose. So another trip you have to make post COVID is to Mexico City because it's just outside of Mexico City. And you can see her studio, her paints, her easel, the wheelchair where she's working. You can even see her bed. And you can see um, there was a mirror that was embedded in her canopy bed so that she could paint from it. Here's her death mask here. And I think um, we'll end with these last two views of Frida Kahlo and, uh, and go back to this idea that this woman who suffered so much throughout her life, physically and emotionally, somehow was able to thrive and to become uh, essentially uh, not only just a, a worldwide icon, a, an icon of beauty, um, but uh, uh, just a, 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 the symbol of strength for so many people. And so I look at these two images and I'm reminded of the ribbon wrapped around a bomb. Frida Kahlo was the bomb for sure. And I think uh, we'll continue to be sort of intrigued and mesmerized by these paintings for years to come. So I'll end there and I welcome any questions or comments anybody might have about Frida Kahlo. What a wonderful and moving inspiration and inspirational story. Um, yeah. it's old. Thank you so much for doing it's, uh, it's it. She's such an amazing figure. I can't believe she almost became a doctor and then decided to be an artist. It's almost like a, yeah. maybe the more difficult position for a woman at that time. Um, but the, um, but Anne Wheelock, asked, um, I'm wondering who took the photographs you've shown of Frida. I imagine there were a number of people taking these, but did anyone or several photographers have more access to her than others? Oh, Anne, that's a really good question. I'm afraid <clears throat> I don't have a, a good answer for you on that one. I should have been better about attributing those photographs. Um, when I did know, like some of that, like a few of them were for Vogue and that sort of thing. Um, I do have the names of some of the photographers in my notes. I'm not sure um, uh, they'll be particularly helpful. Um, there's a, I think the, the photographer's name here, I can just go back here, is named Bernice Colco. I think sometimes they're her friends. Um, other artists as well. I think that's the, the name of the, the photographer here. Um, but I don't, I didn't always put it in my notes. That's a really good question. Were they often um, well-known photographers? I mean, they were in the arts, artist communities um, that, that Frida Kahlo. Yeah, um, I, I think that she, part of. yeah, I think she traveled in really creative circles. So I think a fair amount of, of the portraits of her are done by um, you know somewhat significant artists, but I have a tendency not to reference them if I haven't heard of them before. So I'm not mm. just boring everybody with with a bunch of names that they've never heard before. But and that was a very good question, <laughs> and um, and I'll do a better job next time of, of trying to make note of, of who of who takes these photographs. It's a good question. No, yeah, it's interesting. Um, and then she also mentioned that. Um, I would translate El Arbol de Esperanza mm -hmm. as the tree of hope or the tree of expectation. Mm -hmm. And then she's just like amazed by all of those surgeries and she never wanted to give up. And I think you addressed that pretty yeah. well. Yeah, um, I think there's a little bit of back and forth in some of these paintings. I think some of them have an incredible sense of hope in them. Um, but then there's that picture without hope, which is so hard to look at where you know, the one where she's being force fed pureed food. So I think um, sometimes it, it's, you know, I, I would imagine it sort of depended on, on sort of where she was physically and emotionally, what kind of picture that she decided to, to create. But I think I've always really liked the tree of hope as well. Let's see, that was from, no, I lost it, sorry. Um, 
yeah, showing this duality here. And art historians have done a real number with this one too. I mean, they connect the, the fact that she's um, a patient over here bleeding and being under the sun with this idea that um, there were Aztec rituals that required like human blood sacrifices and that sort of thing. I'm not sure if that's exactly what's going on here, um, but but it's a really powerful picture that shows like these these two aspects of her life and and how her life is sort of bifurcated that way at this point. And then the um, and Roz says in the 1939 painting, the scissors look more like surgical clamps. Oh yeah, okay, you're probably right about that. Stopping, so instead of cutting something, sort of stopping the blood. Possibly. So that's the two Fridas here. Oh, yeah. Yikes. Yeah, yeah I, I could definitely see what you're saying mm -hmm. there, Ross. You're probably spot on. Yeah, let's see, I have to close up too. Yeah, oh yeah, it's oh, yeah. like it's cutting it up. Yeah, yeah, thank you for that. Now I can um, more accurately describe that. I appreciate it. Interesting. All right. And then Kathy uh, says, I see the forehead portrait of Diego as her own third eye. Interesting. So that's like her well of not knowledge and she represents it as Diego. Possibly. I like that interpretation. Interesting. I know there's so much to say about these paintings, right? <laughs> there is. Yeah. Um, and then we just have a lot of people saying, uh, let's see, Marnie, Denise, Kathy, another fantastic presentation, such a painful life, such a strong woman. Thank you both again. Chantal, fascinating, thank you. Why was there speculation of an overdose? I think because her diary had references to like, I hope it's a joyful exit and I hope to never come back, <laughs> hmm. um, which you know could sort of cut both ways. Um, but, uh, uh, I, I'm not sure if there was other evidence that supported that, if there was uh, anything at her house, but plenty of speculation there. There's a lot of pain, a lot of pain. Um, Denise also asked, uh, during her life where she constantly painted self-portraits, I'm wondering, were they always stored with her? Did she sell any? Did she give any as gifts? I know you mentioned the, the one of the deer was right. given as a gift, as a wedding present to a friend. Right. So she did sell, um, she did sell some of her work, but it, there weren't like huge sales while she was alive. And I'm not sure that it was herself portraits typically that were selling. She did paint portraits of other, of other people. <laughs> she did have commissioned portraits, um, but certainly, especially for our purposes tonight, um, they're not as intriguing, generally speaking. And I think her self portraits tell us, you know, just tell such an incredible story. So, um, so I'm not sure if they were all stored at the Casa Azul after her death. Um, I'm not really sure how they were dispersed, but, um, but they have been, um, they've been selling over the years. And I think part of the reason she became really sort of popular and famous again around, um, around the year 2000 is that Madonna started collecting her work, mm, <laughs> people started paying attention. <laughs> um, but the Louvre collected her work while she was alive. I, I believe that she was the first living Mexican art, artist they'd ever collected. But generally speaking, when she was alive, I mean, she was like a distant second to her husband in terms of success and fame. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and then, Claire is just asking if um, there's a place we can rent the Frida movie. And Claire, I think you can get it through the library um, or the DVD anyway. And I'm sure it's available on one of the one of the other channels. I, I think we also have access to Canopy, which is a streaming movie service, which you can use with your library card. And we'd be happy to answer any questions about that if you want to give us a call tomorrow when the, when the librarians are in. Um, and then we just have a lot of great presentation. If anyone has any other further questions, type them into the chat. Yeah, and you can always get in touch with me through my website. I'm yeah. at um, I am actually giving this presentation again, um, virtually on Thursday. If you have a friend or family member that you think would enjoy it, so you can just go to my website and find the registration information for that. Um, but, you know, the big takeaway tonight for everybody, I hope, is Viva La Vida. And Absolutely. no matter what you're going through, <laughs> to be just, you know, 
embracing life and loving life as much as you can. Take yeah. Frida as your inspiration. Absolutely. I mean, <laughs> wow. Um, so Jane continues her series of Art on Tuesdays with uh, Toulouse-Lautrec, Lautrec, uh, yeah. Parisian Nights and Post-Impressionism. Um, at begins at 7, 7 p.m. on April 27th. So that's Tuesday, April 27th. And you can register for that on our calendar or sign up for our newsletter and get notifications straight to your inbox. Um, thank you everyone. And thank you, Jane, so much for a wonder, another wonderful presentation. Um, Marnie just wanted to say gracias. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you um, for your comments. Yeah, this is a, this is a wonderful presentation um, and I appreciate everyone showing up tonight. Thank you. Take care everyone.